All right, Mike here again with the Captain Phoenix channel. So someone sent me this video from Pete Buttigieg that they asked me to go ahead and tear apart. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. Now, I've, I've sat through it just one time and what I've learned from it and what you can glean from it at home and what you ought to glean from it at home is that intellectual Pete Buttigieg is totally economically illiterate. Either that or he's, I'm not willing to apply malice, malice here to this. I'm willing to apply Hanlon's razor, but... We're going to go ahead and just do this basically on the fly. So I apologize if this is a bit stunted um, because I'm not very good at going off script and I'm not very good at doing these sort of things on the fly. But here we go. Drivers are demanding higher wages, health insurance and retirement benefits. Medical expenses is now the number one cause of personal bankruptcy. Thousands of workers across the country flooded the streets today in the largest fast food strike in American history. We have an economy right now that looks good on paper, but has more and more of us feeling stuck. Okay, so before we get started, the economy is, by every metric imaginable, doing extremely well right now. And here are some metrics that we can go by. For the first time in God knows how long, uh, workforce partici participation rates, the labor participation rates, are actually up. Uh, unemployment rates for many demographics have, are the lowest they have ever been and right now are by in absolute and relative terms incredibly low. Uh, what we have is per capita income at even in real numbers at the highest level it's ever been with that number in real numbers increasing. We have our quintiles that we do that we break people uh, that we break uh, financial standing up into so like the top 20% the bottom 20% and then you've got 20% into yeah all of those points are higher than they were for example 10 years ago so and on top of that even with that being considered the poorest among us poverty rates have actually decreased and are continuing to decrease uh, crime rates are down uh, violent crime rates are go are down and heading down murder rates are down and heading down in fact all what the crime rates that I just mentioned, high, high, um, violent crime and murder, are at the lowest rates that they have in our country's history ever been. So, I mean, it looks good on paper because, folks, it is, by every metric, in great condition right now. We can all look at the stock market and see the numbers going up, but that doesn't mean the economy is working for us. Okay, there's a lot to go for here. A, a market in a free market the economy is nothing more than the dis a description of the behaviors, usually in a transactional context, of the individuals that make up that economy. Therefore, the economy can do nothing in a free market but work for the individuals that make up, but work for its constituents. That's the only thing that an economy can do in a free market. And yes, yes, stock markets, the stock market is... is performing incredibly well. We had a correction that lasted about two or three months. It was a pretty steep correction. The market in that respect is cyclical. So these sort of things are things that are just going to happen. And if you just let them happen, we will tend to recover, right? In 2008, we had a crash and then we proceeded to have the worst recovery from a recession in, in our nation's history in terms of the rate of recovery. What was the rate of recovery from our correction from October to December of 2017 or 2018? Significantly higher. I mean, we have economic productivity growth rates that are far in excess of what every single economist predicted or expected or suggested were even possible but so much as a year ago. There are neighborhoods in my community and around this country where it's as if this entire recovery never happened. Yes, it's because you're not actually allowing your, your police, like in Portland, to police the streets. It's because the leftist policies that make unsafe neighborhoods for, for businesses to move into unsafe and continue to make them unsafe. And if you get rid of the scum from, from and, and the crime and the criminality and the hoodlums, as Thomas Sowell describes them, from these communities, what you'll find is businesses will be far more willing to move into these communities. Prices will, will on, on consumables will decline. And because there are more businesses coming to the area, the demand for labor will increase, which means that not only will people have jobs, because the demand for their labor will increase, and this is 
like elementary school economics, when the demand increases, what, pri- what prices tend to do is for that supply is increase, which means that in this case, the price of labor will tend to increase, which means that you don't have to inter- intervene governmentally and that respect directly in order to see wages naturally increase. Because we are living in the most unequal economy of modern times. What? Oh my God. Okay. All right. Yes, the gap between the top and the bottom has increased over the last 30 years. Who in the Sam hell cares? Because the bottom, in real terms, that means corrected for CPI, not necessarily inflation. CPI and inflation aren't exactly the same thing. But, but, but corrected for the cost of living. That bottom 20th percent quintile has increased in their level of income over the last 30 years and continues to be increasing over the last 10 years. Uh, the, and, that's, and that's considering the fact that that quintile that, that hasn't, remained, it hasn't remained stagnant through that period. We are raising the standard of that lowest quintile and the people in that lowest quintile are still increasing in, uh, in, in the people above that. The median household income has increased. We're closing in on $60,000 a year. It doesn't matter how rich someone else is getting so long as we deal with poverty because that's what we care about because i have a way that you can make everyone's income incredibly equal well and and the model of course is south sudan south sudan where everyone's income is incredibly equal because everyone is destitute yeah if you want to crumble the economy and make everyone have make zero dollars an hour i mean by your standard that's a good thing because there's no income inequality because everyone is destitute and by the way that's what your policies are going to to do once implemented in Venezuela, that's exactly what we're seeing unfold right now. Right, We have governmental control over the means of production at a level in Venezuela that is not 100%, but at a high enough level that businesses are, have fled that country. The private sector has exited that country because they have no surety or security that they will be able to remain private, privately owned businesses, that the government won't just come in and take over their business for no reason, right? And as a result, we have, we have a country like Venezuela where people in 2018, lost 25 pounds on average, right? Are eating their dogs. I mean, I've heard anecdotes, though, not from very reliable sources, of the beginnings of of cannibalism in that country because people are so broke and so destitute that they can't even feed themselves. Do you know what we have in this country? We have an obesity problem, right? From In 2018, we didn't lose, on average, 25 pounds. In fact, we are continuing to get fatter as a country. We have such a ridiculous excess of food that not only are we exporting most of it to other countries, we are getting literally fat off the land and wasting and throwing away huge amounts of food to a level that there's actually movements within this country to get us to start using food that is 100% edible that we're just not eating because it does, it's not up to our ridiculous standard. What good does it do to see the Dow rising if life expectancies are falling? Oh my God, one is not related to the other. What good does it do to see the Mets win the World Series if life expectancies are falling? I would love to see the Mets win the World Series, but you know what? They shouldn't win the World Series if life expectancies are falling. Oh, and by the way, the reason life expectancies are falling for the first time ever, first things first, is because we've reached a point in, in human existence where we're having to combat the replication of telomeres in our DNA in order to extend the human life, right? We've gotten to that point. And number two, a huge part of this problem is an obesity academic from a medical standpoint. Uh, the only the only real thing that, that the government has anything to do with when it comes to life expectancies in the U.S. is the implementations of polis, implementation of policies that, res, that distance, for example the end consumer from the provider of the service or good. Uh, In this case, the demand, for example, the interference between the reaction between the doctor and the patient, right? Uh, Go to any doctor's office, go to any primary care facility right now and ask them how much time and energy and money they waste dealing with insurance nonsense and paperwork. Go to a specialist's office, go to an ear, nose, and throat specialist, and what do they do? They will tell you right now that, that the majority of their staff and the majority of the time that they spent they spend in the office, that human being spend in the office working for that specialist is spent dealing with insurance paperwork. And if you got rid of that middleman and started paying cash for everything, all of a sudden that middleman disappears. And folks, this is a rudimentary 
uh, lesson in economics from business. Uh, your first day of business school, this is what they'll tell you, that the, the closer you can get the end consumer of a product or service to the, to the actual producer, then the better the negotiating leverage the end consumer has on the producer, and therefore the cheaper the product they can get, also the cheaper the product they can get naturally. And the perfect, the perfect allegory for this, folks, and leftists, you should be able to understand this pretty clearly, is marijuana. Right, you got your local dealer, and he sells it to you by the eighth. And you know what? He's kind of expensive, and his shit kind of sucks. And there's really nothing you can do about that. But if you can go straight to the farm where they've got, uh, you know, ten different mixes of sativa and indica, you can buy it from the farm cheap and get exactly what you want. Right? Because the farm has to cater to a huge variety of clientele, whereas the local schlub down the street. That jamoke only has to deal with the, the dozen or two dozen or so clients that he's, that he's dealing with. Now, of course, we're dealing with a black or gray market at this point, but that doesn't, but that, but that belies the point. If I can go straight to the farm, I can get a better product and I can get it cheaper. On top of that, on top of that, I know what you're going to say. Well, if you go to the farm, you got to buy it by the pound. Okay. Well, what if, what if I just had two plants growing in my closet? What if I just learned a skill which is how to grow marijuana and cultivate marijuana and then dry it, you know, maybe then, then you know what? There's no way I can get it cheaper than that. Right. Right. And, and this is, this is the fundamental P complete keeps complaining about uh, uh, our economic standing as individuals in, our, in the society today. The only way you can improve your standing in life is with the assumption of risk. You have to take on risk. And if you, and if you preclude individuals from actually take, incurring that risk and experiencing that risk, they'll never improve their station. And this is part of the human condition. It is endemic to the human condition to, to take that risk and improve one's condition. And the people that are more willing to take that risk and are good at doing that, right, they tend to reap the rewards. So, I mean, he's going to get into this in a minute here, and I probably shouldn't be doing this just yet, but... Uh, hello, poor people don't hire people. Rich people hire people. The only way you can justify hiring someone else to do work for you, to do labor for you, is when you have such a ridiculous excess of capital and of human capital that you can afford to ex expend that on, some, on another thing. And you know, maybe I'll get into this at the end of the video, but I'll, I'll, I'll have to get into the, the example of the mechanic, right? You have the best mechanic in town, right? And this actually relates back to the marijuana co conversation, right? If you have, if you're able, so good, if you're willing to take on that risk and learn, learn how to actually cultivate this marijuana yourself and do it in your closet, maybe you can create a competitive advantage in the market by having, in this case, a geographical advantage, right? By being nearer to the end consumer, than the farm is, right? And, you know, I only need an eighth a week, right? But I'm able to produce half, half an ounce a week. So what am I going to do with the excess supply? What am I going to do with that excess capital? Well, I can either throw it away, which is ridiculous, or I can sell it to the consumer. And then I create competition, of course, with the guy in the street, the schlub I've been buying from. And you know what? I can sell it cheaper than he, he can. That's called a competitive advantage. And then I wind up dominating the market. You know who wins from that? Everyone. Everyone. Because I get extra money. I get exactly the weed I want. I get it cheaper than I could possibly buy it anywhere else. And so does the rest of the my my neighbors. So do all of my neighbors. They get the better cheap better weed cheaper. And because I'm growing it, I I can more directly um because I'm the one growing it, right? I could grow a different strand. I could cultivate a different combination of sativa and indica to to meet the demands of the people around me much more directly than, than you can if you've got 18 middlemen to go through who are cutting it up and because they're cutting it up, they have to create more profit. They have to raise the price in order to profit equally themselves. So first things first, the Dow rising has no effect, has, is unrelated entirely to life expectancies. And folks, poor people don't hire people. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. What good does it do to see a low unemployment rate if people who are working full-time, working two, or even three jobs, aren't able to make ends meet? Because whatever dollars an hour they're making 
is better than zero dollars an hour. Hello. And by the way, the people that are most affected by the governmental institution of things like minimum wage, those people that need that skill set. Remember how I said that the only way you can improve your station in life is to incur risk, right? You have to take on the risk of going to college and burying yourself in debt, right? In order to improve your station, you have to learn a trade. You have to learn a skill. It's the, the allegory of the man who you teach to fish. It's such a fundamental allegory. Like, like, Give a man a fish, feed a man for a day. Teach a man to fish, feed, feed him for a lifetime. Right? If you're on an island, right? Your plane crashes and you're Tom Hanks on an island with your volleyball losing your damn mind, right? You could spend all day, and I mean the whole day, doing nothing but, but scraping through the shoreline, eating snails and hermit crabs, right? And barely have enough food to survive the day, right? And you're living in a cave and you're getting rained on and your feet are getting torn apart, right? But you don't have time to do anything else. You have to eat. You have to eat. So that's what you're doing. Or what you could do, what you could do is, you know what? I'm going to go hungry today. I'm going to go hungry today and I'm going to fashion a fishing pole and a rod and a reel and some sort of string and some sort of hook and I'm going to fashion some bait. And I'm going to collect all this food that I've been just eating and use them as bait, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and fish. And then in the morning... Right? Yeah, I'm really hungry. I took on that risk and I reap the rewards. Either I, 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 I catch a fish, which is great, or I don't, now I starve, right? That's the risk that you incur is that because you skip an entire day of food, your starvation rate because it, it, it hits, sets in much faster, right? But the reward is that if you're actually successful, not only have you innovated by creating a rod and reel out of nothing or out of whatever the land will afford you, you can catch fish, right? And catching catching even a, a, a three-pound fluke is far more calories and more food and more nutrition than whatever you're going to get scrounging around the shores for, you know, uh, snails and hermit crabs. And let's say it only takes you a few hours to, to catch it, cook it, fillet it, whatever. Okay, now you have the entire rest of the day to do other things, like fashion yourself some shoes so you're not getting your feet torn up, like building a shelter, so you can actually get some sleep at night and have some energy to fish in the morning. You, you cannot improve your station in life without taking on risk. One of those things that you, that you'd want people to do then is when they're teenagers, right? Is to take on a job. It doesn't matter what the job is. They need to de develop skills like showing up on time, like developing an actual work ethic. And then by doing that, not only do they develop this skill set of, act of at the very least showing up to work on time and doing what your boss tells you to do without, que not without question, but without complaint at least, not only have you developed that skill set that makes you more competitive on the open market when you graduate high school, you've got money that you can back that. At. Now, the problem, of course, is that... Uh, if you're going to raise, he's going to propose raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Who can you afford to hire at $15 an hour? People who can produce at a rate of $15 an hour, which means that you've got, if you've got some 16 year old pimple faced teenager, they have no hope of getting a job. None, none. They're gone, which means now that they, now they have to go to college. And when they graduate college, good luck getting a job because at, while you're at school, you're going to have to start working for free, which for some reason, minimum wage laws allow right? But if you actually got rid of these minimum wage laws, what you'd have is, and since this is the people they affect most, more teenagers entering the market, more teacher, teenagers developing a skill set and earning money as teenagers that they are going to have to earn at some point in order to feed a family, if they want to go to college in order to pay their tuition. And, and this, is, this is the sort of thing that, that raising your minimum wage to $15 an hour is going to preclude. And by the way, by the way, those people that are working those minimum wage jobs and aren't ha are struggling to feed their families, maybe, maybe, maybe don't, maybe pull out, right? Maybe learn the basics of human, <laughs> human biology and learn how, how to not reproduce. Maybe if you're making seven twenty five an hour and working two and three jobs, maybe you shouldn't be having children. Hello, responsible human beings here. This one's fool me once, shame on me, on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You know, at some point you have to t incur the risk of taking on your own responsibility. You know, the reason people were working two or three jobs, if they had the experience to work a job that paid better, would they have to work two or three jobs? How are they going to get that experience? Right. Right.
Economic progress has to mean that we are actually earning enough to live well. We were promised a rising tide that would lift all boats. Sure. Yes, that's called capitalism. Unlike socialism, capitalism makes everyone better off the world over. And for those of you that are going to cite the Nordic countries, the elements of their society that make them better than the, than our, than the complementary elements of our society are fundamentally founded on capitalism, which, which folks, guys, capitalism is nothing more. It's a, not a normative idea. It's a it's purely descriptive concept that describes how humans behave in a free market. That's all it is. And the, and it's and the free market, by the way, is fundamentally founded on the notion that human beings are allowed to alienate their own human capital at their own discretion. This is putting the individual in charge of their own human capital. That's all capitalism is. And furthermore, the notion of the free market is fundamentally founded on the idea that a market is free from outside inter in, from outside interference with mutually consensual transactions consent being something the left seems to only care about when it suits their narrative sure enough gdp went up businesses boomed good thing stock market grew over decades good thing our paychecks didn't show it okay here's a false dichotomy okay so all of those uh so what you see in red here and behind that is is some lines in blue i've seen these charts before so the, the lines in blue are absolute numbers. These are growth in absolute terms. What you see in red is growth in real terms. This is the growth of the income of the lowest quintile in real terms, which means it has already been adjusted for the cost of living. That CPI, again, not being directly the same thing as um, in inflation, so we can call it inflation adjusted. Well, it's really just in, uh, adjusted for cost of living. So not only have people gotten wealthier, They've gotten wealthier in real terms. And the only way that this, that this happens is if you allow people to take a risk by investing in things like the stock market, by saving money, right? Saving money is by itself the, the incurrence of a risk. Setting money aside to say, you know what? I'm not going to spend that on that candy bar right now, which would be really nice. I'm going to save up, right? And when you do that, when you store it in something like a bank, what do people do with that, with that money? They then invest that. And here's how, here's how, here, here is how jobs are created, right? Somebody has this investment income, has this capital outlay of some sort that allows them to front the, the facilities that are needed to have the, the employment, the material goods that are necessary for that employment to actually produce a final product or service and then to have the capital outlay up front to pay the employees who are, who are producing the labor or final good before the net income comes in from the sale of that, that final good or service. Revenues minus expenses equals owner's equities, folks. So the only way that you can have that number at the bottom, that red line increase, which it's showing that it is, the only way you can do that is if you get out of the way of people who are wealthy enough to actually, uh, uh, who have that excess human capital, who have that capital, because they're going to spend it on something. It's not like they're literally going to take that cash and stuff it under their, under their beds, right? The reason that, they're, that they have such a huge, ridiculous excess of human capital is because, folks, they're very good at making money, right? The crappiest basketball players don't play in the NBA, right? Because they're not very good at playing basketball. Right, the majority of buckets scored on the Cleveland Cav Cleveland Cavaliers in 2007 was scored by LeBron James because guess what LeBron James is really good at scoring buckets and you know what that did for them it took them to the NBA Finals. Hello, of course that the people who are very good at making money, who are very good at alienating themselves from their capital, who are willing to take on an enormous risk, of course they're going to be making. A huge amount of money because that's just the nature of human con of the human condition. Our incomes have basically stayed flat. That is why today I'm sharing a plan that fights to get Americans the pay raise we deserve. How do you know what that pay raise is, and how do you know that we deserve it? Because the way that you know that you've deserved a pay raise is by testing the market, 
by telling your boss, hey, I deserve a pay raise, and either the, your boss gives it to you, which would be an indicator that you deserve it, or they don't, and then you can choose to walk and find a job that's willing to pay you more, which would be an indicator that you deserve that raise. If you don't have that, then there's no indicator that you deserve that raise. Just because you think you deserve something doesn't mean you deserve it. Does America deserve a raise? Yes! One that empowers all workers, lifts wages. Yes, that would be capitalism. That would be the free market. And gives both workers and employers the tools they need to thrive in this changing economy. Employers need employees to thrive in this market. And if you create, if you enact an artificial price, price floor that precludes them from getting the labor that they need, then how is that benefiting the employer? How, how is that benefiting our society in general? Because what the society would rather have, rather have is, is the labor. We would rather have somebody working at $10 an hour than have to pay a robot $13 an hour because it's less than $15 an hour, Right. And it's self-evident by the fact that if you don't have that, that artificial price floor, we'll have human beings working, right? And that benefits the employee because the employee has the job. That benefits the employer because the employer has the, the labor that they actually want to have. And that benefits us, our, the society in general, because the products that they're able to produce as a result are either better or cheaper or more abundant because of the labor that they otherwise would have. Because that's what gives the competitive advantage. If you're able to sell it cheaper, if you're able to sell a product faster, or if you're able to sell a product uh, better. Right? Those are the three metrics that you measure a product by. Quantity, quality, and price. And that's where you cre create competitive advantage. And if you create that competitive advantage, all consumers win. The employer wins because he can make more money. And the laborer wins because he has a damn job. We need laws and policies that afford workers more protections, flexibility, control. Let's make sure that in this coming era, Okay, so flexibility, like, um, uh, I, I would like to work for $10 an hour, but I'm not allowed to work for $10 an hour? How is that being flexible? I, I would like to not work under the guise of a union? Uh, how is that me more flexible when you have to work under the guise of a union? We have a rising tide that truly does lift all boats. Thank you for standing up. We stand with you, and we will not rest until everyone has $15 and a union. Right. So those of us who are making $25 an hour, we would rather make $25 an hour, but everyone's going to have to make $15 an hour so that we can level the playing field, which is not leveling the playing field, you idiot. Also, why, is, why 15? Why 15? Why not, why not 20? Why not 30? Why not 100? Why not $15 million an hour? Yes, I did a video on this. I did an article on this. I'll put a link, post a link in this video to that, uh, to that article. Yes, it would be preposterous to propose a minimum wage of $15 million an hour. For the same reason that it's preposterous to propose a $15 minimum wage. I can actually make a principled argument against a $15 minimum wage. That is the same principle that I would be making against a $15 million minimum wage. Right? So notice how your principle is being bent to suit the, to suit the conclusion rather than the conclusion being derived from the principle. And by the way, what about those folks who don't want to work under the guise of a union? Right? What about those of us who have a good negotiating skills? And know how to negotiate in in that uh, employee in in that discussion between the employee and the employer, your pay rate, the conditions of your employment. What if I don't want to work for a union? How is that be, being being more flexible? And how is that going to benefit me? Unions absolutely have their place, right? If I've me and my friends, friends who work for this guy say, you know what, you're screwing us, and what we're going to do is if you don't give us a big pay raise, we're going to walk. Well, they have their place. And that's the place to put them because, you know, maybe there's some sort of negotiative leverage that you don't have as an individual that you would have as a group. But the government doesn't need to protect that. We can choose to walk. And if we just don't show up for work one day, either he's going to have to give us the, the, the wage hike or he's going to have to basically fire us. And that's going to come at an enormous expense, not, not only because he has to fire us, but because he has to replace us with laborers who know how to do our job. And what's called the learning curve, you know, so he has to fill in this area over here. So there's an enormous expense that's associated with just terminating a crap load of employees who decide to unionize together. So why the government needs to get involved is beyond me. And the same, and you know, there's a long discussion to have about unions in the public sector, but it's an entirely different subject. Thank you very much. Yeah! 
Okay, so final final thing that we need to talk about here. All right, I'm going to give you the example of the mechanic. All right, he's the best mechanic in town. He's the best mechanic in town. And he is so flooded with demand. He's so flooded with people that can come to him, that are coming to him, and want his mechanic service, <clears throat> that he's able then to charge a significantly higher rate for his labor, his hourly rate, than the rest of the mechanics in town. Right? That's because he's very good at it. Now, some might say, well, that's unfair to the other mechanics in town. Well, we want the good service. We're willing to pay for the good service. And that's self-evident by the fact that he's able to charge a much higher rate and still keep up his business and still have, still have a situa- uh, condition in which his front door is not closing because people are coming through that door so fast. Well, folks, <clears throat> we're going to go through a little basic economics lesson in, in what's called specialization and what's called how people get rich and how jobs are created. Right? So this mechanic is able to charge a hell of a lot more than everyone else. Right? And all the other mechanics are whining and complaining because we don't make as much as him. Yeah, because you suck at your job. That's called, that's called, the, that's called merit here. Right? Reward by merit. Right? If you go take a class in high school, if you take AP Calculus, you don't know going into it that everyone's going to get a B. Because if everyone's going to get a B, why not just kick your feet up and uh, be high as a kite all morning? Why not? Right? What's the difference? Right? Not doing any homework, not even taking the test, barely showing up, being up for class. Yeah, well, you're still going to get a B. So, um, yeah. And then the one person who's going to be doing all of the work, uh, they get a B instead of an A. How is that helpful to anyone? Well, why even bother having the class? But, but as we get back to our, our analogy here, our allegory of the mechanic. So the mechanic is the best mechanic in town, and he can't keep his door closed. Even no matter how much he charges, he can't keep his door closed. Well, he builds up some capital. And as a result, he's thus able to hire, you know, hire some employees. Now, you might say, well, why wouldn't he just hire one of the other mechanics and pay the same rate? Well, because they don't do as good a job. And if he hires another mechanic to do exactly the same thing that he's already really good at, what's going to happen is that his final product is going to come down in quality. So he's not going to be able to get away with charging that higher price anyways, which defeats, which is a self-defeating argument. It's a self-defeating discussion. Why would he bother doing that? No, he's the best mechanic in town. But he's not necessarily the best accountant. He's not necessarily the best bookkeeper. He's not necessarily the best tax, uh, you know, tax filer. He's not necessarily the best at interfacing with the um, with the customers, with the client base. So he hires an accountant, a bookkeeper. He hires an office lady to handle the front desk, to handle phone calls that are coming in, to handle to process paperwork because he's. You know, this mechanic isn't very good at, at that sort of thing, but he's a damn good mechanic, right? Okay, because of that, because he's not so good at this one thing, but this lady's really good at it, he's increased the quality of his service, which means that he can charge even more per hour and still have the same demand, which means he's putting more money into his pocket. He's hired somebody now. He's hired somebody. He's created a job. And yeah, of course he's making more money because he's really good at what he's doing, right? Right? And of course the prices are going to go up because people are willing to pay that price for that better service. Maybe I only buy a little bit, but that's, that's still their decision to be made. Okay, business is booming. He can't keep up with business. He, he still can't keep his door closed, right? Because all he's done is increase the quality of his final product at a nominal increase in price, all right? Well, I said he's the best mechanic in town, but... He still needs a gopher. He needs somebody to go out and get parts. He needs somebody to hand him a wrench while he's underneath the car. He needs somebody to keep the inventory. Not difficult things, not part of his specialized skill set. So he hires some 16-year-old, right, who's working at the local, vo- who's at the local vocational high school to just do, run some errands. Go, go across the street and get the, the brake orders, right, from, from, from AutoZone. Go, across, go down the road to, Levine, to uh and get me another drum of 10W30, right? I need a whole bunch of 10W30. Well, he's a mechanic, no idea. So I need a whole bunch of 5W30. Go out and get me, uh, you know, have the secretary make arrangements and then you will take the truck and get me a 55-gallon drum of 5W30, right? So not only is this teenager, not only does this teenager have a job, he's learning a real skill because he's working right next to this mechanic. Okay, now I told you he's the best mechanic in town, but there's some certain things that, you know, are pretty easy, right? And, and the 16 year old that he's got hired, right? That he's already paying money to, you know, he's been working for two or three years and he's picked up a few things. You know what? I'm just going to have him do oil changes, you know, light bulb changes, 
wiper blade changes, fluid checks, really basic stuff that anyone with a, an elementary understanding of mechanics can do themselves. And it's not going to take away from his specialty. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be rebuilding transmission. You know, I'm going to be replacing camshafts. I'm going to be uh, diagnosing um, throttle position sensors, right? I'm going to be doing the more difficult stuff that requires a specialized skill set. Okay, now I can increase my volume by having all those people who just need oil changes, who just need, you know, basic checkups. They get flown through, right? So not only have I increased, I haven't diminished the quality of my final product, but I've increased the speed, which means I don't even have to ch charge a higher price. I can afford to pay that guy. Give him a damn raise, which is what you're asking for. I can afford to give this 16-year-old or wait, or, uh, this now 18-year-old a, 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 a raise, right? To keep him there doing some basic mechanic stuff and have him not go to college or not lose him to another employer, right? The result, of course, is that everyone that's involved with the, these three people now make more money, right? And of course, I'm, I'm the one who's taking on the risk of all this, of hiring these employees and, you know, fronting the costs for the, for the goods, Okay, now that I have so many cars coming through the door, right, and now that everyone loves this because they're coming to me, I'm able to pump out jobs quicker than anyone else. I'm doing a better job, and people are very happy to pay that, that higher, that premium price. Okay, so now what I really need to do, what I really need to do is get a second bay, and I really need another guy to kind of take on because my, 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 my 18-year-old is now doing nothing but actual mechanical work, and I need a proper, you know, gopher and inventory guy. So... I need a second pay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save up all that money, sell the shop I have, and get a bigger shop, right? And now i got to be paying basically private developers to build this shop. Okay. The only way I can afford to do that is if I get really damn rich, is if I'm allowed to save up all of this money, invest it in things like the stock market, and get rich off of it. It's the only way I'm able to do this. If I'm still just some average Joe doing an average job or making an what everyone else is making, I don't hire the secretary, I don't hire the, the secondary mechanic, the mechanic's apprentice, I don't hire the, um, the stock keeper, the gopher, and I don't move and have these developers build a, a better facility. And by the way, the facility has a better waiting room for my, for my, a more comfortable waiting room for my customers, has a larger, has a larger facility so we can more efficiently work on our vehicles and we can take in more clients. Folks, this is how the free market works. People that get rich are people that have some sort of advantage that they share with the rest of society. This is how innovation comes to fruition. This is how jobs are created. If that mechanic charged the exact same price from day one that everyone else did, none of these people get hired. Your customers don't get the better service. We don't get the better waiting room. We don't get the faster turnaround. And who cares if the other guys kind of go out of business? Because and, and in the end, in the end, what we want as a community, as a society, is the finished product, is the two job, the three jobs he created in sacrifice of one other, maybe, who cares, and the better service and product that we get as a result of this. I don't know how to describe what Pete is talking about. This intellectual Pete Buttigieg as anything other than just outright ick economic illiteracy. Sorry to say it, Pete, but you, you come across as economically illiterate. Read a book.